think, a, a terrific evening plan tonight uh, with our uh, distinguished panelists on climate change. Let me uh, introduce uh, Chip. He's an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Earth Sciences at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. He's also the Vice Chair of the Honolulu Climate Change Commission. His research focuses on understanding reefs, beaches, and the impacts of sea level rise on island shorelines, and uh, climate change, what the science tells us, now in its second edition, is a textbook that he uh, has published, and that provides a readable layperson description of the latest science on climate change. Chip? Thank you, <clears throat> and thanks everybody for uh, coming this evening. Uh, the bottom line message this evening is that we, as a global community, need to cut our carbon emissions by 50%, 5-0% every decade going forward to the middle of the century, um, or we're going to be experiencing one and a half degrees of additional temperature rise over uh, the background natural temperature. And even then, we need to begin to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in what's known as negative emissions, a process that we can do theoretically in the laboratory, but we have not yet figured out how to scale that up uh, to a global uh, engineering system of removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So we have enormous challenges ahead. Basically, we have a long-term rise in carbon dioxide. And CO2 from 1880, which is considered the beginning of the intense industrial revolution, up to present day, has gone from about 280 parts per million to uh, now it's approaching 410 parts per million. It's on its way to doubling. And carbon dioxide, while it is just a trace gas in the atmosphere, is extremely effective at trapping heat that comes off of Earth's surface once it's warmed by the sun. The warmth created by carbon dioxide leads to a rise in water vapor. Warm air is humid. And that water vapor is actually the most powerful greenhouse gas. So for every one degree of warming you get from carbon dioxide, we get a feedback effect, which is an additional degree of warming from the water vapor, uh, the humidity in the atmosphere. The temperature has risen over this period. The rapid increase in temperature began with the Environmental Protection Agency passage of the Clean Air Act. Uh, there, were, there were nine of these, and they cleaned up emissions so that there were fewer soot particles in the atmosphere, which were scattering sunlight. As those soot particles came out and our emissions cleaned up, more sunlight came in and global warming took off even faster. The result of global warming is a change in the climate, which as I will show you has tremendous changes in the water cycle, uh, the weather system, and the natural ecosystem. Thus far we have warmed the planet about one degree Celsius above uh, background, and our greenhouse gases come from all sectors of our socioeconomic activities, Agriculture, which involves deforestation, commercial and residential buildings, uh, providing electricity and temperature control, uh, industrial activities, our transportation, and uh, electricity production. This is the data collected by NASA. You can see beginning in the early part of the 20th century that the warming is spotty. It has high variability. There's also high variability through time. But by the end of the data set, we have warming in the uh, Arctic region twice as fast as the global mean, and that has uh, disrupted the jet stream. Instability in the jet stream, which should be a rather linear river of winds at high altitude, has developed huge meanders, and a southward meander pulls down Arctic air, creating record-setting snowfall, record-setting cold temperatures and a northward meander in the jet stream pulls up tropical air, creating record-setting heat waves and drought. These are the extreme weather events that we're experiencing and are not prepared for. Extreme rainfall has increased 
we now refer to rain bombs, which are concentrated, intense discharges of rain, which overwhelm our engineered drainage systems. We've experienced this here in Hawaii last April. We had a major tropical system move over Oahu. Uh, we have, uh, the legislature has just released $124 million in emergency funding. Our steep watersheds, which are heavily developed and therefore have a lot of impervious surfaces, which do not allow for infiltration of this rainfall, tend to channelize and accelerate this rain downhill. And even small rain uh, events will pull all the pollutants off of our watershed and send them rocketing towards our coastal zone. And we have a rise in coral disease. We have a rise in mud discharge to the coastal zone because of our channelized watersheds. Kauai took the brunt of this April uh, rain bomb. There were 12 landslides which shut off access. 49.69 uh, inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period was a national record. The damage from this was expensive. Uh, it was devastating for individual homeowners. The Hanalei River jumped its banks and carved a new channel through the town of Hanalei. The channelization in Aina Haina and areas of uh, eastern South Oahu jumped uh, their channels and carved through homes and backyards, delivering mud and debris. Weather disasters have doubled in two decades. And we see a rise in insured losses. Insurance companies have to charge more premiums to cover their losses, which makes all of our lives more expensive. And you are aware of the Western US fire season, which is now almost a half year longer than it was four decades ago. And the number of large fires has tripled. Heat waves are now the deadliest natural disaster in the US. There are more fatalities related to heat waves than there are with lightning, tornado, floods and hurricanes. Flooding used to be the number one uh, most dangerous natural disaster, but now it's heat waves. Globally, we see the same pattern. We see a 15 times increase in flooding, uh, a 10 times increase in drought mortality, a seven-fold increase in wildfires, and a 20-fold increase in extreme weather events. Hurricanes are changing their character. They are larger. The wind speed is higher. They are wetter. They're moving slower. And they're migrating away from the equator towards the poles. In the red circle is the Hawaiian Islands. And you can see a typical hurricane season in the past where most of the tropical cyclones and hurricanes either would not make it out to the Central Pacific or they'd pass to the south of us. This is last year's hurricane season where you see a significant shift to the north in tropical cyclone and hurricane tracks. This is the path of Hurricane Michael, which cut through Mexico City Beach in the Florida Panhandle. You see two types of building responses. One is a total pile of rubble where the building code has not been upgraded. The other is the first floor is blown out and the windows typically are blown out. The buildings that survive are not slab on grade, they are up in post and pier. There is freeboard underneath the building so that storm surge can roll underneath, but with the direct strike of a category three or four hurricane, uh, that is storm surge that reaches up to the second and third floors. These folks were able to go to relatives in Memphis and Atlanta and Houston. When we get a hurricane bearing down on us, we get to go to relatives in Manoa and Eva. We cannot uh, evacuate. We can leave the coastal zone, but we truly cannot evacuate in the Hawaiian Islands. We have a whole different situation. What are we gonna do with the waste? What about the fresh water needs, the human sanitation needs, the medical needs, the food needs, the shelter needs for our populations? We are ready with emergency responses, but we aren't ready with long-term, sustained uh, support for our communities. There are enormous questions as to how we're going to handle this disaster 
And then we have a rise of heat waves around the world for which we have no preparation whatsoever. We have a global water crisis. In 10 years, the global water requirements will exceed sustainable water supplies around the world by an average of 40%. We are already exceeding the natural recharge of our aquifers. In the continental US, we pull water out of aquifers 17% greater than nature can replace that water in a single year. In China, it's 22%. In India, it's 52%. And in the Middle East and North Africa, they're withdrawing water from aquifers thousands of percent faster than nature can recharge. This is the very definition of unsustainability when the one thing we need for life, which is fresh water, is not sustainably used. By mid-century, the demand for water is projected to grow by 55%. We're also documenting that food is less nutritious when there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. Our four primary cereals, soy, maize, wheat, and rice, have lower levels of protein, zinc, vitamin B complex, and iron. This decrease in nutrition is going to lead to malnutrition for an additional 300 million people by mid-century, and one and a half billion women and children experiencing anemia. For example, let's look at wheat. Global wheat currently provides 20% of all human protein. The yield is threatened by drought, flood, and the higher CO2 in the air. By mid-century, demand for wheat is going to increase 60%, but the actual yield will fall by 15%. The tropics are slowly becoming unlivable. The dark red is uh, heat days where it is dangerous to go outside. And you can see that these are centered on the tropics. This scenario is for the end of the century under the business as usual emissions of greenhouse gases. We are currently on the business as usual of greenhouse gas emissions as a global community. So we are headed towards this scenario. And when regions of the planet become unlivable, people move. Food and water shortages can lead to conflict and refugees flee conflict. conflict. People are driven from their homelands, and currently almost 1% of all humanity is seeking asylum, is displaced from their homelands. This is a growing refugee crisis, and it's a global security crisis. The Syria conflict is a perfect example. In the early 2000s, a record drought, and according to re tree rings, the drought was the heaviest drought in 1,000 years, shut down farms around Syria, driving farming families into Aleppo homes in Damascus and other inner city regions. They found a lack of government services, a lack of housing, education, medical, food, and water. And the young men in these displaced families started a civil war. At the same time, we had pushed Al-Qaeda out of Iraq and Afghanistan. They found safe haven in Syria. And there was a chaotic mixture of the rebels, the government forces, and Al-Qaeda. This led to the rise of ISIS. Four million people fled from Syria. They took two routes, either north through Turkey and across the Aegean Sea, or south through North Africa and across the Mediterranean. Smugglers put them in unseaworthy boats. You can see everybody here is bailing, and many of the life jackets are fake. There was enormous human tragedy. The drownings were terrible. Those who made it onto the European mainland moved through the EU because in the EU, the, por the borders are porous. Moving into Europe and then into England is what led to Brexit. The voters of England wanted to secede from the EU and are still trying to figure out how to do that. Germany at first threw open its doors to 1.1 million uh, visitors and distributed them on a, on a very well-designed government program among communities around the German landscape. But the refugees kept coming and Germany couldn't support anymore. Local neighborhoods resisted the influx of these asylum seekers and we saw the rise of a new class of politicians who were authoritarian, nationalists, populists, tribalists. 
None of them su were successfully elected until Sebastian Kurz in Austria was elected on a campaign of closing the borders and ejecting uh, Muslim practicers and wearing of that religious clothing. All of this has led to the recognition in the US military that there is a global security crisis related to climate change. Climate kings and the rise of authoritarian governments are occurring because of the refugee crisis and also when disasters hit, the need to uh, exert special policies and emergency powers. We built society on this assumption of climate stability and that stability is changing. All these things we take for granted they're not just givens anymore. The just released report from the Pentagon climate change and the challenges it's creating for the military. The latest report says global warming is driving weather to new levels of extremes. 99% of my intelligence told me there's an ambush waiting for me. I don't get to say, yeah, but there's that 1% that says there's no ambush. So the hell with the other 99%. As a member of the United States military in 30 plus years of service in uniform, climate change is what we call an accelerant to instability. If you have an area that is already unstable and then has the additional challenge of water shortages or food shortages or a disaster that makes people move, then you can start seeing conflict situations. Serious deadly conflict, a full-blown civil war. If we look around the world today, we can already see conflict and climate in play right under the headlines that we're reading. A new study finds climate change exacerbated the worst drought ever in modern Syria as a consequence of human interference. Fragile social systems just need one more shock to tip them over the edge into social breakdown, into war. Failure to think about how climate change might impact our globally interconnected system is a failure of imagination. The flip side of the climate threat is the energy and resilience opportunity. As a soldier, we're always looking to have an edge on the future. We can pay now, pay later. There are also dramatic ecosystem impacts. The ocean is hotter, it, the pH is lowering as it absorbs carbon dioxide, and it's losing oxygen. There's 2% less dissolved oxygen in the ocean since 1950. We have now have global bleaching events, not individual bleaching events, but we've had four global bleaching events since 1998. They are largely associated with strong Eastern Pacific El Ninos. And with the discharge of treated sewage or untreated sewage, uh, we have invasion of fleshy algae, which when coral reefs um, bleach, the algae will take over and prevent the coral reef from recovering. Humanity has caused the loss of 83% of all wild mammals, 50% of plants. Today we are deforesting the planet at 30 football fields per minute, largely to grow more food on soil that only lasts for five to eight years. Of all mammals on Earth, 96% by biomass are cows and people. 4% of mammals are wild. Of all birds, 70% are chickens. We now have scientific papers with unusual phrases like sixth mass extinction biological annihilation. Has land use pushed terrestrial biodiversity beyond a planetary boundary? Approaching a state shift in Earth's biosphere. And this paper, authored by 15,000 biologists, who stated that humans have pushed Earth's ecosystems to their breaking point and are well on the way to ruining the planet. A lot of bad news but we're doing something about it, right? Last year, carbon dioxide emissions rose 2.7%. In 2014, 2015, and 2016, they plateaued. But in 2017 and last year, they rose again. 
CO2 emissions rose because climate policy could not overcome economic growth. The developing nations want to enter the middle class just like us, and they demand new energy, and about 25% of that demand for new energy cannot be met by renewable sources. There is a fundamental relationship that needs to be broken, the relationship between world GDP and atmospheric CO2. It's been linear since World War II. The International Energy Agency says energy demand is set to grow 25% by mid-century. Renewables will make up only two-thirds of new capacity. Oil consumption will grow due to rising demand for petrochemicals, trucking, aviation, and energy. And CO2 emissions continue to increase to mid-century. Mid-century, that red circle, is basically the same market share of renewables to fossils as we have today. We need to bend the curve immediately of CO2 emissions so that by mid-century, we are essentially down to zero emissions, but instead we're following that black line, the business as usual line. The global carbon law says that if each of us cut our personal carbon footprints by 50% per decade, and that scales up to our families and our communities and our businesses and our countries. If everybody does it, we can achieve this. And I'll end with recent information that global warming is accelerating. We're now projected to reach one and a half degrees above the background in 10 years and two degrees uh, before mid-century by 2045. And this is because of slowing of ocean circulation, which otherwise would absorb more heat, and additional cleaning up of emissions. We're currently on a path to reach four degrees C by the decade of the 2080s. And I'll end with that. Thank you.